Welcome to the Learn Skin Podcast with Dr. Raja and Dr. Hadar, where they discuss all things skin. Skin is fascinating because it affects us in so many ways, like our health, psychology, and how we connect with those around us. This podcast delves into the art and science of skin care. A short disclaimer before we get to the good stuff. Dr. Raja Sivamani and Dr. Hadar Levtov are board-certified dermatologists. This podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only. All opinions shared do not express the views of Learn Skin. Neither this podcast nor any information contained within it are a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. This podcast does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you have a medical concern, please consult with your physician. Hey, Raja, how's it going today? Hey, Hadar, I'm really excited for today's podcast. Really? Tell me why. Really excited to be talking to Dr. Michael Traub today. Holy cow. So just to introduce him, and you know, I think a lot of us don't necessarily have a great understanding of naturopathic medicine when we're outside of naturopathic medicine, but boy, is it a rich field with a lot of rich tradition. And who better to talk about than Dr. Michael Traub? He's the director of the Lokai Health Center in beautiful Hawaii. And we'd like to welcome you to the podcast, Dr. Traub. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you too. Great. So, you know, for starters, I was thinking if you could give us an overview of naturopathic medicine, and then I thought we could dip into some topics that deal with how naturopathy approaches some of the dermatology topics that we'd like to discuss. Okay. Well, naturopathic medicine as a profession began about 120 years ago now, around the turn of the century, in the early 1900s. And it really grew out of a tradition of natural healing methods that were both that came from Europe as well as incorporated some of the traditional healing methods that were part of the Western herbal tradition here in the United States in the 19th century. And the profession was very small to begin with, but grew quite rapidly in the early 20th century where there were large gatherings, annual conferences in some of the major cities back east and where thousands of naturopathic doctors attended. Basically, the, the roots include hydrotherapy, the use of water to cure disease, herbal medicine, physical, what was called physical hygiene at the time. It was like how to take care of the, of the physical body through exercise and manipulation, so similar to chiropractic and osteopathic medicine. So it was kind of an amalgamation of the various natural therapies that were in vogue at the time. And through most of the 20th century, it, it was really truly a drugless profession. Pharmacology was really not part of naturopathic medicine, but that changed mostly in the 1980s as states that licensed naturopathic doctors incorporated the ability to prescribe medications as it was seen that although most patients would go to a naturopathic physician because they didn't want to take drugs, many of them were on drugs and to help transition people from a drug-based treatment to a more natural one, it was also necessary to be able to prescribe those medications. So now most naturopathic licensing laws in the United States and Canada, where the profession is really at its strongest, incorporate prescriptive authority. And the degree of that authority varies from state to state. So it's no longer a drugless profession, but it's, it's you know, a profession that uses drugs very carefully, cautiously, and with a, a lot of, well, I guess I should say just caution when prescription medications are used. So in the 1980s also, the profession kind of came back from a period of decline where in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, there were very few naturopathic doctors practicing anymore. And a lot of that was actually because of the successes that occurred in medicine during that time with prescription medications, with the advent of penicillin, for example. And so less people were interested in becoming naturopathic physicians for those 40 years or so. And in the 70s, with the increased interest in holistic health, a naturopathic medicine kind of rode that wave of popularity and began to interest more people into going into the field. And as that happened, the principles of 
naturopathic medicine began to be articulated into six primary principles. And those are basically to, first of all, do no harm. And second of all, to treat the entire person rather than to break the body into parts and just, you know, take it from a more reductionistic approach and rather than a holistic approach. The idea of the term doctor, meaning teacher, to really include the aspect of educating our patients rather than just, you know, giving them something to take, even though it's natural. The idea of prevention, of primary prevention, to really try to help prevent disease in the first place by healthy living, healthy lifestyle, and also to treat the underlying causes of the diseases rather than just symptomatic treatment. So those are some of the basic principles upon which naturopathic medicine is based. The modalities that are used range from nutrition to botanical medicine to homeopathy to physical medicine, including manipulation, counseling, lifestyle counseling, psychological counseling. And nowadays, there are various specialties of naturopathic medicine. For example, my specialty is naturopathic oncology. There's naturopathic pediatricians. We don't have really a professional specialty of dermatology, but with the way things are going, that might happen sooner than later. So there is a trend in the profession now towards a more kind of following the the conventional specialty training and focus in practice. So I'm going to stop there. I could say a lot more, but I'm, I'm aware that I've been talking for a while. So I'll let no, that was wonderful. That, that was actually very succinct and informative formative, I think, because most people may not understand what naturopathy is, and it's good to encapsulate it like you just did. So thank you very much. I'm wondering also, just to round this up, what kind of basic training does a naturopathic doctor in the United States, at least, usually go through? I know not everybody is the same, but I think I was surprised to find how rigorous the training is, at least in the beginning. Yeah, there are seven accredited naturopathic medical schools in the U.S. and two in Canada that are four-year programs. The first two years traditionally have been kind of focused on basic medical sciences, similar to what you would, you know, get in regular medical school. And the second two years more on the clinical training. Now the curriculums are more integrative. So the clinical training begins earlier and the, the basic medical sciences are kind of integrated also through the course of the four years, which I think is a good thing. I think it's a more progressive form of education. Right, that is what is happening in Western allopathic medicine as right, well, I believe. Yeah. Right, right. So it is rigorous, as rigorous as a conventional medical school program. And although, you know, we promote a healthy lifestyle, most naturopathic medical students graduate after four years and they're pretty stressed out, pretty burned out, and they need <laughs> they need to start taking <laughs> care of themselves and practicing what they're getting ready to preach. So maybe this will be a good transition point to talk about Why do you think naturopathy is a great field for dermatology, for skin disease? Well, I would say the first reason is because of patient demand. I practiced for several years with a dermatologist, and a lot of people would come to see her, and they would say, you know, I don't want to take medication. What what else can I do? What other options do I have? And because we were practicing together, she would refer them to me. And over time, she learned about what I did, and now she incorporates things like food allergy testing into her practice. And we don't we don't work in the same office anymore. But she also uses some you know topical, over the counter natural medicines rather than you know you know some people do not want to take topical corticosteroids, for example. And she recommends vitamins for certain dermatological conditions as well. So I think that there's a growing interest on the part of the, the, you know, our patient population and consumers in general who want to approach their skin with a more natural, holistic approach. And Michael, could you differentiate what is the difference between natu- naturopathy and homeopathy? And before, I, before you get into that, is it naturopathy or is it naturopathy? I've heard it pronounced both ways, and I want to be sure I don't mispronounce it. Both, either or both. You know, it's sort of like tomato, tomato. It doesn't really matter. Okay. And can you differentiate homeopathy with naturopathy? Because every time I speak to people, they think it's the same thing, but I think it's important to realize that they are different. Isn't that right? Yeah. Naturopathic medicine incorporates homeopathy, but homeopathy does not incorporate naturopathic medicine. 
Homeopathy is a system of medicine that was developed prior to the birth of naturopathy in Germany by a man named Samuel Hahnemann. And he discovered the, well, he developed the practice of using highly diluted medicines to stimulate the body's own ability to heal. So a homeopathic medicine is prepared in a special way where it's diluted over and over again and shaken during that process and usually administered in a liquid form or tiny little pills that are dissolved under the tongue. And that system of medicine is taught and included in naturopathic medicine, but it's no more the same as naturopathic medicine than herbal medicine is the same as naturopathic medicine. Naturopathic medicine is like a umbrella organization that includes a wide variety of natural healing modalities of which <clears throat> homeopathy is one of those and herbal medicine is another and nutrition is another and exercise and lifestyle therapeutic lifestyle changes are another. So I hope that helps to clarify it for people who think that naturopathy and homeopathy are the same. No, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, and it, I think it's really important to differentiate that. And I think that's great that you were able to outline that. Now, one of the areas that you have been talking about, which I found fascinating, and it was one of the first lectures that I'd seen from you too, was this concept of humor within the treatment paradigm. And I know you're going to be talking about this at the Integrative Dermatology Symposium in more detail, but can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your perspective on humor and how that can be used within dermatology? Sure. Well, a few of our younger listeners who don't know who Norman Cousins was may not know that for over 30 years, he was editor of a journal called Saturday Review. Or it was a weekly magazine that everybody read. And people of my age remember that Norman Cousins cured himself of ankylosing spondylitis by watching funny movies. So this is when laughter as medicine or humor as medicine showed up in the medical literature about almost 20 years ago now. And in be, beginning in 2001, there was this, this series of studies conducted by a Japanese allergist named Hajime Kimada. And the first mention that he made of his therapeutic interven intervention of humor was in a letter to the JAMA in 2001. And then he had a series of studies that were published over about a 10-year period. And in his JAMA letter, he gave credit to Norman Cousins for giving him the idea for his research. And in his first trial, he took 26 patients with atopic dermatitis who were all also allergic to dust mites, and most of whom also had allergies to cedar pollen and cat dander. And after going 72 hours with no medication, they underwent skin prick tests before and after viewing the Charlie Chaplin movie called Modern Times. And the size of the resulting wheels were measured and a similar procedure was reported before and after an 87 minute video that featured weather information and the wheel responses to dust mites, cedar pollen and cat dander were significantly reduced after watching the Chaplin movie and the effect lasted for hours, but watching the weather had no effect on the wheel size. So this was kind of, I don't know if it was randomized, but it was, it was a small trial that showed that humor could have a you know, beneficial effect in patients who had atopic dermatitis and these allergies. And so Kimata went on to you know, kind of reproduce his findings, in, not in the same research design, but in similar research designs. And he usually had people watch, you know, Charlie Chaplin's movie, Modern Times, as the therapeutic intervention. But some of the studies, he, he used Mr. Bean's funny movies instead. So he sh showed that there were certain physiologic changes that went on in these people besides the wheel response to allergens. Um, one of the things he found was that hormone in the body called ghrelin that has to do with sleep and with appetite, that they were higher in kids with atopic dermatitis than in healthy kids, and that watching funny movies didn't change the ghrelin levels in normal kids, but it did lower it in kids with atopic dermatitis, and they also slept better. So these are just a couple of the studies that he did. There are a number more that I'm going to you know, go through when I do this presentation in October at the Integrative Dermatology Symposium. But uh, it's just a fascinating area that caught my attention some years ago, so I do 
share this when I when I do lectures on atopic dermatitis as as one you know kind of fun therapeutic intervention to include along with the other things that we're doing. Thank you. That's fascinating. Actually, I'm not sure what's funnier, watching Charlie Chaplin or thinking about the people <laughs> watching the weather yeah. episode and their miserable face, not to mention they're probably worsening atopic dermatitis as they watch it. But I wanted to ask you, have you taken some of these principles into your practice? And maybe you can share a pearl or two on how you actually do this when a patient comes into your practice. Well, you know, I mentioned that my, my specialty besides dermatology is naturopathic oncology. And Cancer is not funny, but it's also, it, it's very heavy for a lot of people because, you know, there's a lot of doctor visits in, involved and nurses that are involved. And a lot of people who have cancer have not had very warm, enjoyable experiences with their other care providers. In fact, sometimes they're, it's, it's pretty brutal. And so I make it a point when I see a patient with cancer to try to get them to laugh as early in the encounter as possible. And just to kind of lighten up the energy because I think that people really appreciate that because they have their, more than their share of worry and fear and discomfort and all kinds of other things that uh, tend to dominate their, their awareness. So without you know, being flippant, I think that there's a way to integrate humor into the, the, you know, the medical visit in a way that is beneficial, not only for the patient, but also for the doctor. That's great. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your talk at the Integrative Dermatology Symposium, because I think that you don't have to be a funny guy to be able to introduce some humor into your practice. I think it's, it should be bread and butter for any physician. If you can't laugh, you know, you probably, some part of you is not alive. Yeah, um, so I, don't, I don't consider myself a particularly funny guy. I mean, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't think I'm known for my great jokes or my sense of humor, but I do, I do succeed more often than not in getting my patients to laugh and smile and, you know, get beyond their, their suffering that they come in with. I also think that they're, you know, one of the best types of humor is dry humor. So you don't have to be a funny person. You can use your dryness as a way to be funny too. And that works well for atopic dermatitis. <laughs> All right. So I think... I think, you know, this is so fascinating and there's so much more to discuss, especially the concept to me that's very interesting is the concept of the physician as a teacher or a coach. And I, I think I'm looking forward to more conversations with you, Michael. And I want to thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. And I hope people learned a little bit more about what naturopathy is and maybe can share a laugh or two with their patients. I hope so too. Thank you. It's really been enjoyable to talk with you both. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for tuning in to the Learn Skin podcast with Dr. Raja and Dr. Hadar. We would like to take this moment to tell you about our upcoming second annual Integrative Dermatology Symposium to be held at the Coronado Island Marriott in San Diego, California. This program will be three days of jam-packed information, including case-based discussions and multiple perspectives on topics such as psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, diet and the skin microbiome, cannabinoids, hair loss, traditional Chinese medicine, and much, much more. Go to www.integrativedermatologysymposium.com and register by July 31st, 2019 to take advantage of our early bird special. We look forward to seeing you there.